Hello, everyone. I'm Nina Berman. I am so disappointed that I can't be there with you in person. I was really looking forward to it. Um, but thank you tremendously to the conference organizers for allowing me this opportunity to try and present my paper to you on video. I hope it's not too awkward. I'm going to do my best. So um, let me share my screen. My paper is called Dressed Up, Stripped Down, Media Depictions of Conflict Rape. In it, I look at the photographic treatment of survivors of wartime rape. My primary focus of this talk will be on two recent high profile publications in Time Magazine and the New York Times where I analyze the aesthetics and the ethics of the picture making. This paper was recently published in the book, The Cunning of Gender Violence, Duke University Press 2023. The book brings together work by feminist scholars from across the globe. In my paper, I argue that there are double standards in the depiction of conflict rape survivors with black non-Western bodies treated differently than white one, than white American ones. I argue that the framing of the imagery follows depoliticized, decontextualized rescue narratives embedded in the humanitarian industry, which has come to dominate large swaths of photojournalism. I also argue that analysis of reporters' notes which accompany the pictures present highly problematic narratives which paint the journalist and the media companies as somehow doing rape survivors a favor through the picture taking. And finally, I argue that the pictures themselves, despite the language around them, are regressive and fetishize the body in ways which should make feminist cringe. My aim is not to go after particular photographers, but to point out patterns which are worthy of analysis. So my interest in, my interest in the subject of wartime rape started when I was a young journalist in 1987, and I went to Vietnam with a group of American veterans from that war. While in Ho Chi Minh City, we were mobbed by dozens of children born from American soldiers. These children were looking for their fathers and they followed us to the airport thinking we might bring them back to the United States. They were sobbing when they realized that was not going to happen. It was truly heartbreaking. The US press rarely reports on rape by American soldiers. Even today, those Vietnamese children who are now adults are described as having been born from relationships or love encounters between, between American troops and Vietnamese women. This is quite a euphemism. We know very well that rape was widespread, horrific, and standard operating procedure during the American War against Vietnam. A few years later, in 1992 and 1993, I was reporting from Bosnia for Time and Newsweek on rape as a weapon of war. I interviewed and photographed survivors, their caregivers, loved ones, some women wanted to be identified, others wanted to remain anonymous. I photographed both ways. I also photographed perpetrators. 20 years later, a picture of one woman circulated on the internet and she emailed me to say she was terrified because her husband had no knowledge of her past trauma and I needed to remove her picture immediately, which I did as fast as I could, as best as one can in the internet age. I'm not showing her picture here. This was, of course, a horrifying moment for her and a mortifying one for me. I have since asked myself, how can we as photojournalists and feminists do better and be more responsible to the people in our pictures? And so it was with deep surprise and a bit of outrage when I saw this photograph published in Time in 2016. It was made by the celebrated American photographer, Lindsay Adario, to go along with a story by Aaron Baker about rape survivor programs, primarily in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The title of the story is The Secret War Crime, and you see this kind of language frequently, The Secret War Crime, The Secret Life of Child Brides. It's a promise that the reader is going to be led into some dark forbidden territory. So I'd like to deconstruct this image for a moment. The background is gray and bland without spatial or temporal context. The woman could be waiting to be examined in an office in New York City or in Zagreb or anywhere in the world, but she is waiting to be examined. For some viewers, myself included, the 
picture in its composition and gaze recalled the specimen studies researchers made of enslaved people in the American South in the 1800s. The woman in this picture is named Ayak, but we don't hear from her till the very end of the story. She operates instead as an aesthetic labor, a generic illustration, a stand-in for every Black African wartime rape survivor. Eventually, we're told that Ayak lost her family to a rebel attack in South Sudan. Well, on the run, she was raped, then raped again at a United Nations camp, impregnated and infected with AIDS. She says, quote, I want a family, I want a husband, but the doctors say there is no cure for my disease, no one will ever marry me, unquote. And that's about all we hear from Ayak. So how did this shocking photograph, which was the cover of Time's international print edition, come about? We learned that the idea from the picture came to the photographer in her sleep. When she woke up, she checked in with Kimberly Smith, who was the American woman who ran the NGO, which invited the Time journalists. Smith herself was also a rape survivor and carefully cultivated her own rape into a media commodity, writing a book and granting interviews. One headline in an American Christian right-wing right publication said, quote, how a courageous Christian woman who survived rape at the hands of slave raiders in Sudan keeps braving bombs and violence to save orphans. Smith liked the idea of photographing Ayak nearly naked and Adario says Ayak didn't hesitate. The experience is then reported as a moment of sisterhood among survivors, whereby the journalist helped create for the subject an empowering transformation. The reporting and picture taking become a vehicle for Ayak's emotional healing. There are reporters' notes which accompany the story. Adario's notes, strangely, unprecedentedly, have been scrubbed from the internet, but you can still find them on the internet archive. Over time, the photographer says, Ayak's body language changed. She stood proudly, more confidently, at peace. It seemed that the very act of photographing Ayak and her unborn child gave her the opportunity to celebrate the very thing her perpetrators had tried to rob from her, her beauty and her dignity. The photographer continues, for two days, we all shared deeply personal experiences, which often culminated in tears and sometimes oddly in laughter. Photographing Ayak and listening to her story was a privilege and an extremely positive, intimate moment amongst three women who had all in fact experienced some form of rape or sexual assault as a weapon of war in, her, in our lives. So, I'm not questioning the emotion of the picture taking moment or the intensity of the experience for the reporting team. What I do question is the equivalency suggested by mentioning that three women are somehow intimately linked because they are all experienced some form of sexual violence. Ayak was violently displaced from her home country and family. She was raped multiple times by age 17. She became pregnant with no access to abortion. She's HIV positive and is apparently without medicine. She's living in a state of poverty in a safe house in a foreign country run by an American Christian woman she only recently met. She's about to have her first baby with no clear means of support or family structure and no path back to her home country. But none of that is important. The main action here is that Ayak, with the help of her American enablers, is worthy of our gaze because despite her rape, she embraces her unborn child and in doing so becomes beautiful to herself and to us. Her beauty relies on our gaze and her as a mother. Time and other publications brand itself through its individual photographers and like to emphasize a photographer's state of mind, compassion, dedication, and sacrifice to the story. Informing readers that the photographer and writer also experienced some form of sexual assault is designed to validate the image production and by extension time, the corporate entity, and put the readers at ease and calm any feelings of discomfort around this shocking photograph. In this construction, time is doing Ayak a favor. American editors have on many occasions refused to commission or publish pictures deemed too disturbing or sensitive for American audiences, or they find workarounds. This was a cover for a story in time on university campus rape. Could anyone imagine an American journalist asking a white American teenager, eight months pregnant, raped multiple times without a home or source of income or future security to strip for a photo? Would we ever see a picture like Ayak out of Ukraine, for instance? 
The time piece and conflict rate is similar to a New York Times story about Boko Haram kidnapped survivors. Like the Times story, the image of victimhood is reframed as female empowerment, and the reporters and photographers are cast as conduits or cheerleaders for this transformation. Being seen, coming out, unveiling, entering the spotlight of the world stage in a kind of journalistic striptease becomes central elements of both stories. In the Time piece, the rape survivor disrobes to show her newly found confidence. In the New York Times piece, the survivors are prettied up to show their newly won dignity. In both, the body is highlighted and the politics and context are diminished. In both, the voices of the women themselves become secondary to the aestheticized representation of the female figure, all of this justified as feminist storytelling. So I need to show a quick video here because the Times piece uh, has some intriguing design elements which can only be showed in video. So, okay. Um, so this is a, a video of what you would see if you signed on to the New York Times and looked at the piece. In April, 2014, more than 200 girls were kidnapped from school in Nigeria. The world responded with this hashtag, bring back our girls. And we see uh, this video. Boko Haram dressed them in dark gowns and head coverings. And four years later, they have been freed. And the New York Times with photographer Adam Ferguson decided to track them down, even though uh, they were still in danger, even though they didn't wanna be photographed. And they photographed 80 something women in one day in this kind of weird catalog design element. So as you scroll down one after another, one after another, you start to kind of try and see if any of the women talk, but they don't talk. And they start to do this strange kind of come hither thing. So the girls have thrown off their Muslim robes, put on jewelry, makeup, fixed their hair, and are gorgeous. Scrolling down woman after woman, 83 photographed in one day against different colored backdrops. They float in boxes across the screen. The viewer naturally goes to click on a picture, as I did, hoping for added text or maybe some audio, but there is nothing. The women are mute, only to be gazed upon like princesses or catalog models. As the feature progresses, this strange thing happens, as I've showed you, they briefly come to life, eyes move in slow motion, and ever so tightly turns towards the camera. The project is called Portraits and Dignity, but actually the women are turned into objects disconnected from their stories. If not for the headline and the occasional caption, the presentation could pass as an online shopping page, reducing the women to objects of consumption, a decidedly unfeminist bowl. There are also reporters' notes to the story, which you can read online if you wish. They are simply too inane to repeat. The Time and New York Times pieces show how current industry practices in visualizing conflict rape emphasize the survival role played by Western feminist journalists in bringing healing to Black and brown rape victims through the photographic encounter. The aesthetics of this encounter are influenced by the commercial demands of the digital economy and the nonstop race for eyeballs, clicks, likes, shares, etc. Moreover, the selective focus by which the dominant Western media decides what rape story is worth seeing is inextricably linked to the politics and commercial priorities of the commissioning entities, which rarely turn the lens on their own militaries and instead promote a white Western exceptionalism through the cover of feminism. In presenting these case studies, I'm not suggesting that journalists stop reporting on conflict rape or gender violence, nor am I trying to admonish or embarrass individual journalists. But when two of the most high profile publications present work, which claims solidarity with women, and yet the picture making is so problematic and prioritizes the female body over everything else, it's important to ask, in my opinion, what is going on and how do we do better? Thank you so much for paying attention and I wish you a wonderful conference.